Thank you, Sarah, and welcome to the Shazy Author Series in Austin, Texas. We're streaming live on Facebook, and I wanted to welcome everybody uh, in the Facebook, Facebook world. Uh, and uh, of course, we are here to visit with Steve Harrigan, um, who has graciously agreed to be our guest. Enthusiastically. Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, I was in Cape Cod with my friend Amy Voorhees, who's here, and Amy was engrossed in this book, and, and, in a book, and it was this book. And in fact, this is your book, I think. And That's why I couldn't find it. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, Steve Harrigan, yeah, I'm going to try and get him for our Shazy series. Um, so I'm going to give, do a little introduction um, about Steve. He was born in Oklahoma, but quickly came to Texas and lived in Abilene and Corpus Christi, two very different cities. Um, he's a longtime writer for Texas Monthly. In fact, he's still writing for Texas Monthly. Just published a really interesting article in the January issue. Um, he's also published um, in the uh, New Yorker uh, magazine, The Atlantic, Audubon, National Geographic, to name a few. Um, he's the author of 10 books, including, I'm sure a lot of people in this room have read The Gates of Alamo, which I have read when it came out. It was the New York Times best-selling uh, novel. And he also wrote Ben Clinton. He's also written screenplays, um, including The Last of His Tribes, starring John Voigt and Graham Greene. And he's recently done a TV production called Colt. Now, it just keeps going. He's a UT graduate, and you're a fellow at the Mitchell Center? That's what they tell me. I'm not sure exactly. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, we all learned about the Mitchell Center when uh, Jim Magnuson was here and filled us in. That was fascinating. And we also got to meet Dominic Smith, who was a graduate of uh, the Mitchell Center. Um, he's a founding member, along with Bill Whitliffe, of CAST, which I am in Austin should be you know, incredibly grateful for the gifts that we get to enjoy through CAST. And he's won numerous awards like the Texas Writers Award. <coughs> but tonight what we're going to be doing is discussing his 2016 book called A Friend of Mr. Lincoln. Uh, it's a novel, a historical novel. And what I was hoping, Steve, you could do is give us a summary. So whoever hasn't read it, like Amy devoured it at Cape Cod, and I've read it, but whoever, just give us a summary. Well, it's, uh, can everybody hear me okay with that? No, yes. Uh, thanks again for inviting me, and, and it's really fun to be here, Carrie. Appreciate it. Uh, it's a novel about Lincoln's early life from, from 1832, roughly, to 1847, when he was a, a young lawyer and state legislator in Springfield, Illinois. It starts uh, in the Black Hawk War in which he, was, he fought and ends when he goes off to Congress for the first time, or the only time, in 1847. And it's, it's called A Friend of Mr. Lincoln because I invented his best friend. Okay. I, uh, I decided I wanted a, like a, a close-up view of Lincoln at this very formative time of his life. So I just unplugged a couple of historical people and plugged my guy in so that I could have him in the room at, at, you know, at all these really important moments. Uh, a lot of the book has to do with his, some would say courtship. Uh, they said then embrittlement with Mary Todd, uh, which was a very uh, strange and kind of troubled relationship almost from the beginning. And it's really about, uh, this you know, great American secular saint, Abraham Lincoln, and what he was actually like when he was a work in progress, when he was not fully formed as as a you know as, as a as a you know fully embodied you know emancipator and and, and uh, you know principled character, but was, was still somebody who was trying to find his way. And as a, he was a pure politician, you know. And it's interesting to sort of look at him in the light of what we, this country has just been through <laughs> this last campaign. 
you know, if Lincoln had had a Twitter account, he would have been, you know, stepping over himself every bit as much as Donald Trump. I mean, he was in there fighting all the time. He was desperate to get ahead. He was had, I think, a, a strong moral compass, but it was not always, you know, he's not always following it. And so he was always getting into trouble, either kind of romantic trouble, emotional trouble, ethical trouble, strategic trouble. Uh, he, wasn't, he wasn't a mess, but he was just a guy. You know? <laughs> and he was somebody that, that I think uh, we would all recognize as a, as, as a, a real human being as part of his life. Well, you mentioned that, and the book does spend a lot of time on the relationship and the courtship. Uh, you give us a deep look into the multi-year on and off again courtship between Lincoln and Todd. And I, I found that personally fascinating. And so my question is, what was fact and what was fiction in, in, that, in the, the book? And then where did you get all that information about their courtship? And I just, it really helped me. What, what helped you with that piece of the story? Well, nobody knows exactly what happened between them. They, Mary Todd was a, a, a very sort of aristocratic young woman who came to, to Springfield in her early 20s from Kentucky. From Kentucky. She spoke fluent French. She had been to this Madame Mantel's Academy where she, where she was highly educated. She was passionately political but unable to express herself politically because women couldn't vote and they were even discouraged from, from, from uh, camp, having anything to do with the campaign. So she comes to, to Springfield, Illinois, which is the state capital, and she meets Abraham Lincoln, who was this nobody from nowhere, and, uh, but was a kind of galvanizing presence. And it was clear she was going to marry somebody. I mean, that's why people came to Springfield from Kentucky, and because it was a really happening place. And she, she and Lincoln got involved. And it's hard to know from the historical record exactly what happened. We do know that he, he sort of got engaged to her, or at least she thought that they were engaged. And he had a habit of doing this. Uh, he didn't. He didn't know anything about. He was, you know, he, he was clueless, but they got, they kind of got engaged. He kind of seemed to have fallen in love with this other young woman named Matilda Edwards. He seems to have tried to get out of it. Uh, he went to her house to say, it's over. She ended up in his lap kissing him. <laughs> so it was back on again. Then he tried to get out of it again. And something happened around that time, around the, First week of January, 1842. I'm sorry, I've forgotten everything I knew. Something happened that threw him into a suicidal depression, and that's where the kind of speculation has to begin because nobody knows exactly what went on. My suspicion is, and this is bolstered by various historians, most notably this guy named Douglas Wilson, who's really written a great book about. Lincoln's early life, for this period of his life. I think what happened is Mary released him from his vow to marry her in a letter. He got the letter and saw how, how he had destroyed his own sense of honor. He felt obligated to marry her. He tried to get to weasel out of it. She, by giving him permission to weasel out of it, she sort of undermined his, his sense of himself as a, as, a, as a responsible human being. And honor was the big thing in Lincoln's life. And he just totally cratered. And his friends were like taking away knives and razors. And he fell into this really just profound depression for about a week or 10 days where everybody in Springfield was talking about it would even live, you know, because he was so desperate and But to answer your question more directly, it's historically accurate. Uh, I mean, I went to a lot of work. I've talked to a lot of scholars, you know, Lincoln scholars, read all of his diaries, everything that would pertain to this. And, and then, you know, what I did do was give myself permission to make up, make up this character. 
in Cage Weather to, to put him in, in those situations where he could actually talk to Lincoln about what was going on. So those conversations obviously are fictional, but I think the, the, the basic thrust of the story is, is historically accurate. I'm glad you bring up the topic of fictional conversations because I this is a this is something that interests me and I've had just a discussion with your buddy Elizabeth Crook about it. So there's a lot of dialogue in this book. And obviously, it's not uh, quotes. So you make up a lot of dialogue for Lincoln, uh, some fictional characters, as well as some other historical characters. And there have been more novels. You know, Elizabeth's first book, The Raven's Bride, she put uh, words in Sam Houston's mouth there. Um, other books like uh, Loving Frank about Frank Lloyd Wright in The Paris Wife. And so, how do you, I mean, you have to take a lot of responsibility. You're taking, you're putting words in Lincoln's mouth, and Elizabeth had a lot to say about that. And I'm, I'm curious as to, obviously, you, you have, you have a clear decision about the way you went with that. Yeah, I, part of me doesn't really approve of what I've done. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because I'm, uh, you know, I've spent much of my life with journalist and a reporter and you know facts are all important to me. There, there are no alternative facts. <laughs> and, yet, and yet that's what this is. <laughs> you know, it's uh, it is a obviously this never happened. But the scaffolding is there. I mean the the the, and I don't believe in anything called like a higher truth or anything that fiction which is a higher truth. I, I just wanted to do it, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I just thought I, I thought I could understand Lincoln. I thought I could get inside his head, uh, or at least the heads of people around him. And I thought I could animate what a reasonable facsimile of life in Springfield in the 1830s and 1840s would be like. So, uh, you know, I. I'm, I was extremely scrupulous about the historical record in this book. I mean, maniacally. But I did give, you know, give myself a break. I mean, when if I if I make up dialogue, I've just told myself like it's okay for me to do that. I mean, it's a big issue. I mean, there are people who completely disdain the whole idea of, of, of historical fiction. Uh, particularly when you're dealing with historical characters, because everybody knows it's not true. It didn't happen the way you're saying it. But I think if you if you approach it with a kind of semi-scholarly, you know, uh, you know, strictness about it, you can um, you can conduct yourself in a way that a reader will come away from the book feeling I haven't been cheated. I've I've, I've learned something. I you know I. I've learned as much from reading this book as I might from reading a biography. Well, I definitely did feel that way. I came away and I felt like I did learn quite a bit. Um, so you tell you, you said you really wanted to write it. So tell us how you came up with this idea to write this book. I mean, where did this uh, my kernel wife, come from? My wife and I were driving from Austin to Cape Cod one summer. <laughs> And that's a long way. <laughs> and we, we got uh, on, on tape or on you know, digital audio, we got uh, Team of Rivals, the Doris Kearns Goodwin book about um, Lincoln's cabinet for the most part. But we were listening to that book, and, and on the way, we were in, I think, somewhere, we were, we were leaving Hannibal, Missouri, where we were going to Mark Twain's home and gone on a riverboat cruise or for, for an hour. <laughs> And uh, we were listening to the book, and she doesn't, Doris Green's going, doesn't talk about a lot about Lincoln's early life, but there's a little bit in there about his life in Springfield. And uh, I remember so vividly there was this one passage from a letter that she was quoting, and it was a letter that Lincoln, when he was living in Springfield, before he met Mary Todd, he met another woman named Mary Owens. And Mary Owens, sister was trying to get him together with Mary Owens. And she said, you know, this, her sister said to Lincoln something along the face, have you got to marry my sister? And he said something along the lines of, okay, I guess so. <laughs> and, 
And so they were engaged. <laughs> and, uh, and Mary Ellis came to, to, to visit her sister in New Salem, which was close to Springfield, where Lincoln was there, living. And Lincoln wrote her a letter saying, uh, the most equivocal love letter in American history. <laughs> he said, you know, well, I, we're, if you still want to get married, I want to do that. Uh, Springfield's kind of a fancy place, a lot of people in carriages I couldn't afford to get back down into that. But uh, if, you, if you still want to do it, I will. But in my opinion, you had better not. <laughs> <laughs> That, that line, actually the line was, in my opinion, you had better not do it. And that line just was electrifying to me for some reason. We were driving in the car, and I just thought, this guy is so confused. <laughs> and he's so trapped. And he doesn't yeah. know what in the world he's going to do. And I just thought, that's a good character. And we were, um, so we, uh, we made a little detour to Springfield, Illinois, where I'd never been. And we went, you know, the, the city, which I'm sure some of you have visited, it's, it's, it's not <coughs> going to look exactly like it is back, back then, of course, but it's, it's laid out in the same way. So you can, you can see the streets that Lincoln walked on. You can go to his house where he and Mary lived, uh, their first house, and their only house. And you can walk in, and you can see on the mantelpiece, the wooden mantelpiece, the holes where the children hung their Christmas stockings. And it just felt so unbelievably real. And I just thought, what would it be like to be walking down some Springfield Street and see Abe Lincoln coming the other way? And I just started thinking about that and couldn't stop it. Well, you, your description of him, I, I just felt like I got to know him. I mean, you know, his, your, his physical description, his, his, his sense of being funny, his storytelling, his, just his angst. And his mess with Mary Todd, you know, you just wanted to say, oh my God, this is so classic of a young man who doesn't have any guidance and he relies on his friends. So, how long did it take you to write it? And I, I think you mentioned that you, you made several trips to Springfield. Tell us about your, your research. And, and I, you writers are so dedicated. I, I well, bet this took forever. It took, you know, three or four years, uh, which is about average. You know, there, you know, there were a couple trips to Springfield and uh, talking to Lincoln historians, but mostly just reading, reading and reading and reading and trying to, you know, I went on, a, 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 guy, a guy took me on a, on a tour of Lincoln's judicial circuit, you know, that was a lot of fun, and we crossed the rivers that he would have crossed or the fords. Uh, I went to the, spent a lot of time at the Lincoln Library, you know, looking at things, looking at old law cases, talking to people. They were all real excited because uh, Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter was about to come out. <laughs> <laughs> and the guy who wrote that had uh, done a lot of research there too. <laughs> well, mostly on the non-vampire parts of Lincoln's life. Um, but it was really fun. I mean, it was really fun to, to go there and, you know, and just you know, partly, you know, a large part of it was research, a large part of it was imagination. I was trying to kind of, you know, convince myself that I was there in the room with Lincoln. Well, you, you did in so many ways because when, you're, when you talk about him, and I was going to mention about the, you know, my dad was a lawyer and a, a judge, and just tell us a little bit about his circuit days because I found that really fascinating your description of them riding across the prairie you know if it's spring it's gorgeous but if it's you know if it's winter time it's horrible and they all slept together in rooms of like these inns yeah. tell us a little more about that well you know, great. in all these uh, it was the eighth judicial circuit and I, I've lost count of how many towns they went to or how, you know, how many square miles it was. But it was a long, it was, you know, weeks long circuit, like twice a year. And these towns didn't have judges, they didn't have lawyers. So all the lawyers and the judge would get together and they, it was like a traveling circus, you know. And they, <laughs> they, they, they'd stop at, uh, you know, these flea-bitten inns and uh, some of them were better than others and they, you know, there was no, there were not, not enough beds for everybody, which is true back in that time, generally. So they would all sort of 
tile into a bed, you know, two or three to a bed. Uh, they get bitten by bed bugs, they eat, you know, greasy food. Uh, they get up the next morning, they go to the next, you know, to the next county seat. There'd be, a, you know, a, a, a whole lot of people there waiting for them because people needed to be represented in court, so the judge would set up court, the, the lawyers would, would, would represent people. Who yeah, were they're like in the square, right? Yeah, people right. come up and they hire you like on the spot to yeah. tell you your case and then the lawyers go have to go and, prepare. Right, yeah. And it was, uh, I mean, to me, <laughs> <Not> <laughs> it, to me it was like being in a rock band. It, was, it sounded like so much fun. I think Lincoln really enjoyed it. I think they got in the way of his marriage with Mary Todd when they did get married because, you know, she was, they were living in a one-room boarding house. I mean, one, one room in a boarding house with a little boy. And Lincoln would say, well, sorry, i got to go on the circuit with all the guys. <laughs> He'd be gone for six weeks or something, and she'd be there, never done any of her own laundry or anything, because she had servants or slaves back home. So she would be stuck in this place, and Lincoln would be out, you know, having a great time. Mm -hmm. He seemed to really enjoy the, the, because he got to be the showman then. And I, uh -huh. do you think it challenged his intellect, too, but he would have to come up with, your know, arguments on the spot. It wasn't like he had weeks to prepare his case. Yeah, I mean, he was, I think he, I mean, I think he was a, a truly devoted lawyer who really enjoyed the law and really understood the law. And uh, I think it was challenging, it was gratifying. Uh, and, you know, he was, it was interesting because I went back to some of the old court records and you'd see Lincoln would be representing somebody one day, and the next week he would be suing the same person, you know, because whoever got to him first, you know, he was a gun for hire, you know, and uh, and you know, it, it was not a, it was not a principled thing, except there was this great principle of the law, you know, that that was sacred, I think, to Lincoln, and so you know, as part of what, part of what he and Cage sort of split over in this book, the the, the friend of Mr. Lincoln, is, is he, Cage can't understand Lincoln's strict and strategic devotion to the law at the expense of, 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 of some other things that, are, that, that he thinks are sort of morally, morally outweighed. Mm -hmm. So when you're doing all this research, you know, you've, you're, is there anything that you came across that you just couldn't believe, it was just a shocking or revelation to you? Uh, the, it's, there were small things that were really important to me that I discovered. One of them was, well, one of, one of the things I knew was that the Donner Party left Springfield in the summer of 1846. Oh, yeah, I want that little detail. And one of the, and Lincoln was not in town. In fact, there was a point at which I thought, it'd be interesting to put Lincoln on the Donner Party. So, <laughs> <laughs> i fair, but I didn't do that. But, but Lincoln wasn't in town. But, but he knew James Reed, who was one of the leaders, the, actually the big leader of the Donner Party. And he sued James Reed and he defended James Reed. And there was a, uh, a famous murder in which Lincoln uh, uh, represented this guy who, who basically killed this guy in cold blood. And Lincoln got him off on a, on, on a self-defense, on this blatantly ridiculous charge of self-defense. And I realized, as reading through some of the there weren't any depositions, but there were just there were little documents I could read. I realized one of the people who testified in that trial and was there when uh, this guy uh, Jacob Burley was killed was James Reed, you know, the leader of the Donner Party. And so you, you make little discoveries like that, and it just—I mean, it wouldn't mean anything to anybody but me, but it 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 it, it helped create the story for me. It helped it helped me understand where I was headed or where I could head. And so, uh, you know, just things like that. And, and it, the, the real, the really important stuff was like, for instance, going to Mary Todd's house in Lexington, Kentucky, and getting a sense of, oh, this must have been what her life was like. You know, because there's a lot of, I mean, and I shared this, going to, to, the, to this book, Mary Todd has got such a terrible reputation. And but when you see, okay, she was a little girl here, and this is what her life was like. And she had, you know, her mother died when she was young, and her stepmother moved in and had like seven more children, and she was sort of shunted out of the way. And you start to think, well, you, you develop this real empathy and, and understanding of these people. And 
so that's how, you know, just that, that kind of research makes it, makes it real, which makes you as a writer charitable mm -hmm. toward everybody, I think, mm -hmm. with malice no toward none. <laughs> well, I love the reference to the Donner Party because it helps you remember, you know, they were almost on the edge of the frontier, right? And there was still this Western expansion. The other thing you drop in is a little reference to the fall of the Alamo, which I thought was Couldn't hilarious. Help I know, I just <laughs> love it. I just literally laughed out loud because I, you know, I just thought, he just couldn't help himself. And it helped, though, as a reader, to put, you know, to set my mental timeline. So I found it helpful as a reader. Well, also, I think, I, I find it hard not to believe that Lincoln didn't model himself after David Crockett, because they were kind of the same guy. You know, they came, they, they, they had similar backgrounds. They were both uneducated. Uh, Crockett, could have gone all the way to the presidency. I mean, it's it, it's not inconceivable that he could have been president if he'd been a little better politician. Uh, but but you know, he was like one of the most famous people in America at the time Lincoln was coming up, and uh, he would have been riveted by Crockett's experiences. So when he hears he's been killed at this strange place called the Alamo, you know, he'd be just as as, as you know galvanized as everybody else. Um. You mentioned that you used uh, Billy Herndon's uh, notes in his biography. Do you want to tell the audience kind of who he is and why his notes in his biographies are controversial? Well, yeah, William Herndon, Billy Herndon was Lincoln's last law partner. And he, he, was, he was his partner when Lincoln went off to, to, to become president. And he was younger than Lincoln and really looked up to him. He was serious drinker too. And Lincoln was a total teetotaler. Uh, but Lincoln was killed and Herndon, fortunately for all of us, took it upon himself to gather as much information as he could about Lincoln's early life. So you, he wrote to everybody Lincoln had ever met, who had ever met Lincoln, and said, Tell me what you know. Tell me about it. What was his life like? What was he like at this time? Tell me the straight truth. You know, I mean, he would write people back and say, "Don't, you know, don't. I don't want myths. I don't. I just want real stories." And so much of what we know about him comes from the notes that he compiled. Now that it's not perfect what he compiled, and it all needs to be weighed carefully by historians, and has been. But it's also Mary Todd ended up hating him. Uh, because he is the one who unearthed the story of Anne Rutledge, who was the girl in New Salem that Lincoln was desperately in love with, who died uh, from brain fever, I think. And uh, Lincoln almost <coughs> had another period of, of, of deep, dark depression. And you know, people were really worried that he would survive that. Mary did not want this information out there that Lincoln had loved somebody else before her, and she sort of went on this campaign against Herndon, which infected a lot of subsequent biographies because people tended to sort of discount some of what Herndon had written. But his, his reputation is sort of coming back now, mm -hmm. and and I think he was like, I mean, without Herndon, we wouldn't we wouldn't know very much at all. You know, this is kind of a I, uh, you know, it, your, your book really portrays his ambition and his, how political he is and how, you know, he would spend months on a campaign trail for Henry Clay, for example. I mean, just, just tirelessly campaigning for his party, which was the Whig party at the time. And I wonder if you have any insight as to why some people are so politically motivated and so politically involved. You know, there are people in Austin that we know of who just, you know, that just, they're just passionate about that and will spend, you know, every moment, spare moment like that. Do you have any insight what drove him both politically and, and just his ambition? Well, I think what drove him was his ambition. I mean, I, and I think, I think it's different for different politicians, I would guess. But, but for Lincoln, I think he had in common with a lot of people at that time. Uh, the desperate need to be somebody, you know. I mean, he was nobody. He, he, 
uh, you know, he was this farm boy who, who had very little schooling and taught himself to read, basically, and his mother was dead, his sister was dead. It was, you know, him and his father who he didn't like, and he needed to get off that farm. Uh, and he was, there was just an innate ambition, you know. Um, and if, if you wanted to be somebody, really the paths were very few. I mean, you, know, you joined the militia, you fought, in the, fought the Indians, you became a doctor or a lawyer or a merchant, but, but you, all those paths also leaded somehow to, to the legislature, you know, where you could sort of control your fate a little bit, you could acquire land, you could, I mean, Lincoln was not above, you know, you know, sort of kickbacks and stuff like that at this point in his life. And so he, uh, you know, he was, uh, you know, he was somebody who really wanted to be somebody. The other thing is, I think, what draws people to politics in general, and I'm not a political person, so I'm just speculating, is it's fun. You know, you're, you're with people who are like-minded, you, you, you've, you follow in with a tribe and you're all sharing the same common goal and the stakes are high and it's intense and it's, you know, it's riveting. And I think uh, he was certainly not, uh, not immune to that. Mm -hmm. He was very strategic in his political, I mean, it seemed like it, you know, he... Strategic when he yeah. wasn't, you know, falling on his face. Right, right. <laughs> um, so did you have any particular challenges in writing a book about such a well-known and documented historical figure or any pushback from editors or...? No, the big challenge was just internal, like, uh, making sure that I put the, the iconic Lincoln as far out of my mind as I possibly could, and just to just to focus on him as a normal human being. You know, I mean, sl slightly more than normal. I mean, he, but you know, one of the things that really helped me was I realized as I was doing this research that there were Springfield was crowded with dynamic, interesting people. There was Stephen Douglas. There was uh, 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 John J. Harden, who was who was a, a magnetic character, who was uh, who who very easily could have been somebody really big, and actually was. And there was Ned Baker, Edward Dickinson Baker, who was one of the greatest orators of his time. And when you, I kept thinking, okay, I'm, I had to write a lot of party scenes, which are hard to write for complicated reasons, but. You know, you walk into a party in Springfield, Illinois, in let's say 1840, something, maybe early 1840s, late 1830s, and you look over there, and there is this guy, this six foot four guy. He's talking to a six foot two guy. He's talking to another six foot four guy, and one guy's kind of rustic and looks kind of looks like his clothes don't fit right, and the other two are just really turned out, and they're magnetic and compelling. And you ask yourself, well, which one of these guys could be president? <laughs> maybe that guy, maybe that guy. No, I don't think that guy. <laughs> you know, and that would be Lincoln. And so, you know, you, you, he was extraordinary, but not as extraordinary as we would think he was. You know, he was, he was in this scrum. He was a political hack trying to make his way, trying to <coughs> outdistance everybody else. And, you know, Springfield was so gave us a wonderful sense of that, what it must have been like to be at those parties and, and, and that, and those men trying, men, because the women weren't involved in the political scene, you know, their search for legacy, their search to, to make themselves. And I guess there's that kind of that frontier mentality too, you know, making yourself out of nothing. Right. Um, so let's see. If, if, if I wanted to read a biography now, I do want to, on Lincoln, what, which one would you recommend? I don't want to read uh, Richard Lawrence Miller's ongoing work, something that detailed. <laughs> I want something readable. Well, probably, the, uh, it depends on, I think probably the, well, probably the best one volume is, is, is by David Herbert Donald. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's a fairly recent biography. It's, you know, there's Carl Sandburg, if you want to read that. It's, it's a little, uh, you know, legend, legend I, I would think probably Donald's book is, is, is the one to start with. 
Okay, and can you tell us what you're working on now? You should, you're, I know you're busy. I'm very busy. I'm writing uh, the history of Texas. Oh, well, that's all. That's all. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, yeah. how fun. <laughs> it might be. It's fun, fun for us when it's fun we publish. We can read it. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can do that. And see, if, see if it's fun. But it's it's it's. I'm having a good time with it. I, it's, but it's it's something I've never done before, and it's it's a different mm -hmm. different thing for me. But I'm, it's it's really interesting. Okay, and I have a. I'm going to ask. I'm going to read one more thing and ask a question, then I'll open it up to the floor and. So this is in Steve's acknowledgments, and I just love this. Uh, so this is him talking. He says, you say, I try to keep weepy eye effusions out of my acknowledgment pages, but I'm not sure it would have been possible for me to sustain my writing career if I hadn't had the luck to live in a place and at a time where my friends could include such remarkable, talented writers as Larry Wright, Bill Broyles, Elizabeth Crook, Bill Brands, Gregory Curtis, Bill Whitliffe, and Jim Magnuson. Each of them provide moral support and editorial support. And I have heard from, we've had several of these uh, writers come and talk about kind of this, and they've all mentioned this very important group. And I, I want you to tell us about what that group has meant to you. And, um, well, it's, 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 vital, I think, for writers to have uh, friends. <laughs> and uh, uh, it's... In rare. In rare, yeah, that's true. But I met Bill probably, what, 1980? 81, something like that? I think my first book had just come out. Maybe your first movie had just come out? Uh, I don't know. It seems like there was never a start yeah, but I remember I remember sitting at Robert Barnstone's house and we had us having a long talk. That's the first talk we had, and met Sally there too. And uh, I mean, to find to to talk to somebody who who you understand, who understands you, who's doing the same thing. I mean, I don't I don't think it matters what business you're in, what profession you're in, but you know, if you're a gardener, I mean, you want to be around other gardeners. You, know, you want to know, know people who understand what that's like, and so it's. You know, one of the big challenges of, of being a writer is keeping up your morale because there are, uh, there are, there are successes and failures and uh, books that go nowhere, books that you desperately want to go somewhere but, but don't seem to have the, you know, don't seem to connect. There are reviews that can be good or that can be bad. And there are all sorts of reasons not to do it anymore. And that's when you, you know, you need to, to talk to your friends. And, and you know, to, uh, you know, all the people I mentioned there in, in that acknowledgement thing are people whose work I've read before publication, who's, who've read my work before publication, who've, you know, weighed in on things that could be better or, you know, sort of helped me understand if something was working. I didn't have to worry about. So I mean, it's just a, 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 crucial, uh, a crucial element, I think, in anybody, anybody's life. I mean, friendship and, and comradeship and collegiality and that kind of thing. And you guys, you all have lunch once a month, once a week? Uh, well, some, uh, like Larry and uh, 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 Bill Brands and uh, uh, Greg Curtis and I have breakfast every Monday. Uh, but we have lunch with Bill all the time, and I have lunch with Elizabeth all the time, and uh, you know, Bill Broyles. And so I mean, it's just a yeah. You know, it's a we. A lot of us go back way back to like Texas Monthly Days or Texas Monthly Days. And, uh, so it's just you know, it's a lifetime friendships. All right. Well, I'm sure you all have questions for Steve, and so I'm going to pass the mic off. I, I see hands going up, and Sharon can help me with this. Uh, David. Steve, so interesting. Thank you for sharing. Um, you know, the picture, at least I got, of Lincoln and Team of Rivals is the sophisticated, strategic, uh, passionate, intuitive master of politics. You're describing a 
a much rougher figure, and I'm just wondering if you can identify what shaped him. How are, are am I misreading? Well, I, I may have over overemphasized his sort of rawness and unfinishedness. He was he was clearly cut out for this. He was clearly a political animal, and he did think. You know, he was a vote counter. He was a favor doer. I mean, he 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 knew how to to, to work the levers. Uh, I guess where I'm, what appealed to me in this part of his life was that he wasn't mature yet. You know, and he was he didn't know where the where the boundaries were yet. And you know, to be fair to him, nobody really did. It was it was the wild west. But he. Uh, he thought nothing of, say, uh, suing somebody and writing and running against them, or running a candidate against them at the same time, and, and running scurrilous art, anonymous articles about them in the paper, doing all that at once. He, uh, he got into a duel, a near, a near fatal thing, because he humiliated this guy. I and mean, he kept doing this. There was, a, there was an interesting cruel streak in life. You know that he tempered and, and tamed himself up, but there was one occasion where he humiliated his political opponent so so viciously that the guy broke down and started sobbing. And he would uh, he would make fun of people. I mean, he had a great sense of humor, but he would you know he makes fun so much fun of this guy uh, that uh, the guy challenged him to a duel, and Lincoln had to try to wiggle his way out of it. He couldn't find a way out of it. It's a really serious thing. And Lincoln, as the challenged party, had his choice of weapons, and he chose broadswords because his <laughs> arms were really long. And he, and he, uh, he, he, he man mandated that there would be a, like a, a, a box drawn that they couldn't come out and, you know, step out of to give himself this incredible advantage <laughs> over this poor short guy, you know, Tim Sheep. So he, he, those are the kinds of things that I think, those are the kinds of grasping character traits that I think he purged himself of. And he should be given great credit for that uh, because he did have a, you know, a strong moral compass. But like, for instance, on the issue of slavery, uh, you know, I mean, he was never going to risk his political career by, uh, you know, by coming out all, all in against slavery. He just wasn't going to do it. He thought it was wrong. He thought it would be better if the, you know, if if, if people were sent back to Africa. <laughs> I mean, he wished that there were not there's not slavery. But I mean, this was a position he was, you know, pushed into by events, you know, in terms of abolition. And so, I mean, I think it's unfair to judge him uh, by our standards, of course. But it's interesting to view him in his own time and, and to sort of um, speculate about, uh, you know, the, the currents that were carrying him toward his own destiny. Okay. So to give you a frame of reference, Steve and I go back to when our children were in preschool together, and part of that group is Teal Clark, to give you an idea of <laughs> what that looks like today. Uh, Steve, I'm curious about your thought process in conjuring up the character of Cage as his best friend. What were you thinking about making this particular man that you created his best friend? Well, the important thing to me was to make that character ideally as interesting to the reader as Lincoln himself. And, uh, you know, that was my you know, overriding concern because I, I didn't want him just to be a device. I want him to be like a real living, breathing character. And I started to think, well, who could that be? You know, who could, who would be interesting enough for me and interesting enough for Lincoln to kind of, you know, go through the book with? And, you know, when I was reading about Lincoln and learning about him, I, I realized he was a member of a poetry society in Springfield where these guys would get together and read their poems to each other. And I thought, well, what if the guy's a poet, or at least, you know, that's his application? And, and so I started to think about that, and I started reading a bunch of biographies with 19th century poets, and tried to figure out what his background might have been. 
And the other important thing was that I didn't, you know, it's called a friend of Mr. Lincoln, but I wanted that friendship to be rough. I wanted it to be not just this carefree, you know, dude thing, but I wanted it to be, you know, I wanted it to clash because uh, there were there were clash worthy things going on, particularly slavery. Is it? So I just started thinking about who this guy was, where he would have come from, what was important to him, what he was longing for, and you know the important thing for me was that his ambition as a poet had to be as strong as Lincoln's ambition as a politician. And once I kind of you know reckoned that that was that was the kind of parity between them, then I then. He, he, he kind of came alive for me. Yeah. Oh. oh, sorry. So it sounds fascinating talking, figuring out the evolution of Lincoln. And I'm wondering, what, um, what do you find fulfilling in bringing this man from the rough man who has ethical lapses and moral lapses and character lapses into someone who became one of our strongest presidents and do you find that particularly fulfilling to own a personality like that and figure it out and ride it and then i'm going to ask a second question actually if you don't mind i'm fascinated to know about what vision or spirit you're taking into your book on texas oh okay well the first question is well they're both kind of complicated to answer, but uh, the, the first one is like, to me, what, what was fun to do was to play with the reader's expectations of Lincoln, you know, because I knew I was dealing, it's the same way with this, this novel about the alibi, I dealing with Davy Crockett and, you know, all these people that you know, everybody had an opinion about, and I thought, I didn't want to overturn anything, I didn't want to be just, you know, <clears throat> knock over the furniture, but I wanted to like, as you say, own the character. I want to want to make him my my character, and um, you know, I just thought there was room for another interpretation of Lincoln, and this seemed like this period of his life seemed relatively unexamined uh, by by novelists, and I just you know, the, there was no real guiding principle. It's just make him as interesting as I can, make him as unexpected as I can within the boundaries of historical fact. And I guess to some degree that's what I'm trying to do with uh, the history book, you know, is to, obviously I'm much more circumscribed by what, it, what really happened, but if I can make it interesting to me, I'm assuming it'll be interesting to the reader. I mean, that's a big assumption, but I'm, I'm, I'm just heading and going that way. So I, you know, the last thing I want to to write is a kind of conventional history book. So, like for instance, my book starts, my history of Texas starts in I think 2012 when Big Tex catches on fire at the <laughs> State Fair. You know, I mean, I just want it to be. They want to sort of diffuse expectations and go and start in another way and, and, and find just find stuff that's like right now I'm, I'm reading writing about uh, Charles Goodnight, you know, who was one of the great Texas ranchers, and you know um, it's kind of boring writing about range policy and <laughs> fence cutting in the 1880s. But if you start to think about uh, you know the fact that Charles Goodnight made a, was in a movie about, you know, buffalo hunting. You know, he would live long enough to, to see that happen. And he, you know, he, 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 you know in famous cases where he, he let, you know, Comanches on the reservations, you know, run down buffaloes in the old way. I mean, when you start thinking of those things, you start, you know, just look for things that interest you on a kind of human level. Um, you know, the fact that buffalo hunters in the 1870s, you know, they had these Sharps rifles, these 50 caliber rifles, but they also carried around an extra cartridge filled with, with cyanide in case they were captured by Indians and they could, you know, bite down on that and kill themselves without having to be tortured. And, you know, when, you, when I find something interesting like that, it animates it for me and I think will animate it for the reader. So, but there's no, there's no thesis. Everybody asks me, well, you know, 
what's your take on Texas? I don't have one. You know, I just, I don't know. I'm just writing it, you know, and seeing what, you know, writing what interests me. I love the book. I lent it to Carrie. I haven't seen it since. <laughs> so I can't remember the name of the friend of Mr. Lincoln. It's Cage. Uh, yes. Yeah. Right, what really struck me, well, he's a poet. They all, all the buddies get together. They write poetry. And it is, I would say, uniformly bad poetry. <laughs> and was it fun for you to write bad poetry? Well, I <laughs> Cage's poetry, I thought, was supposed, to, was supposed to be pretty good. Uh, I, the bad, the really bad poetry uh, in the book, some of that was real. I mean, most of that was real. It's very the really good poetry sentimental and sentimental. <laughs> that's what struck me. Yeah, but it was sentimental. I mean, that's like the, uh, you yeah, know, you had to sort of take your cue from, from I, 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 I took a lot of, uh, sort of tonal things from Longfellow when I was trying mm -hmm. to. Uh, or like Poe on a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it's just, you know, it's like it had to be credible, but it had to be credible to that person. And, you know, and, and so sometimes I would kind of summarize and paraphrase what, what I thought the poem. I mean, I also had to write dirty jokes, you know. I mean, because <laughs> Lincoln was a big purveyor of dirty jokes. And so, yeah, you know, I just did the best I could. <laughs> could you say something about how you keep up with your research? How do you organize it or uh, um, keep track of it? It's so defeating. <laughs> it is overwhelming. And it's, I, I learned like, I, I take notes, I take lots of notes, but the system is not, you know, apt for, for the task. And so I'm always sort of, where did I, where did I write that down? Where did I, you know, I've, I've got, you know, notebooks and I've, uh, but it's, it's just not, it's, I'm just not an organized person. And so a lot of it is, you know, it's different for fiction because, you know, your your imagination is doing a lot of work. When you're writing history, you've got to really be careful about everything, obviously. So what I've, what I've realized when I'm writing, uh, like this book I'm working on now, is that it's fruitless for me to uh, be researching Lyndon Johnson now because I'm writing, you know, about, you know, the 1890s, say. So I need to I need to research each chapter as I go. That way I don't forget where I put things. <laughs> and I, can, I can just start writing that that chapter, and then I'll of course reference, you know, footnote it and, and you know, you know, so so. But I know you keep it. some of it on the computer. Not as much as you think. I do a lot of handwritten, uh, you know, notes because for one thing, it's appealing to me to have you know sort of come out of a project with a bunch of paper. <laughs> and and for another, I, I just uh, it just feels it, it's hard to take notes on a computer when you're looking at a book. You know, it's easier to hold the book <coughs> right on a clipboard. So. But everybody does it differently, and there's no perfect system that I. I mean, I, I have friends who have unbelievably great systems for information gathering, but I just I just can't do it. I'm just I, I don't know how to file. I, you know, I, I, I bristle at the idea of order. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You're leading me into the question I had with what you just said. I'm interested in, you referred to um, in the acknowledgments, your group of friends that have supported each other. I think of writing as the type of writing you're doing for this as quite solitary as opposed to magazine writing where you would possibly go into work and have your colleagues with you and so on. Um, and I'm just watching and participating in the changing media uh -huh. throughout current times. And do you think that, how do you see writing as you do for books and writing as you do for articles and writing as you do for film? Um, how do you see that changing how you work and, and 
the opportunities for people to become really full-fledged, able to support themselves writers. Well, that's a whole, uh, supporting yourself is a whole other issue. <laughs> and, you know, I, I honestly have no answer for that. I mean, I feel like I was lucky, very lucky, to get into <clears throat> the various worlds I inhabit at a time when I could actually make a living doing it. I mean, all, uh, I mean I've mean, i been a screenwriter, or a magazine writer, and a book writer, and uh, when one thing flags, yeah, I can usually sort of jump to another and make a little money. Uh, but, it, I mean, all three of those pursuits are, they're different, you know, each is different, but they're ultimately a little alone in a room writing this stuff. And so there is a kind of solitary and even secret part of this where, you know, you're, you don't want to show anybody you don't, you know, you just want to, you want to just write and see what comes out and then, you know, try to see if it's worth showing anybody. Uh, I think it's, I don't know how much it's changing, I mean, in every front. I mean, magazines are, uh, they're, you know, they're more in, interactive, I mean, because of all the whole digital side. There's, there, you know, in the old days you might get a letter from somebody in the mail. Now you get like, you know, 20 comments telling you what a jerk you are. <laughs> and, you know, there's a, there's a sense of, a, there's a clearer sense of an audience out there it, it, with, with books. Uh, and I kind of like this. It's, with books, you know, you've got people on Amazon and Goodreads and, you know, the weighing in on what they think about your book or what they think about you. Sometimes that's a little, you know, deflating, uh, but other times it's, 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 it feels good to know in a way you never did before that there's actually an audience out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, those people were always hidden from you, you know, before. And so, uh, but I, I don't know, the whole idea of, of making a living as a writer is it's, it's, uh, perilous, <laughs> and it always will be. Because there just aren't those jobs. I mean, there were. I, I had a job as a staff writer at Texas Monthly for about ten years, but other than that, I've been a freelancer my whole life. And uh, you know, it's just scrounging <laughs> and and you know, trying. I mean, but I, my goal. And I, I only realized this recently. I, my goal was. I didn't understand like saving money. That how could, people could ever have money to save or put aside. Because my idea of 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 you know, making a living was to make enough money to write the next thing, you know, and so it was just all invested back into time. So, uh, you know, it's the idea of, of working for money just never occurred to me. <laughs> you know, it was working, working to support the writing. Okay, it's time to wrap it up. Okay, thank you. So, Steve, thank you so much. I know that I stalked both you and Bill at the uh, at the gala, the literary gala that shared the, the, the Library Foundation puts on, and you were both so gracious to say yes to me, and I just want to say thank you. Well, you're so, I'm so excited. Bill's good. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you to Sharon Watkins, who's made this space available for us and who came up with this concept. So, and thank you all for being here.